Well, I want to welcome you to Wednesday 1130 Bible study at Doctrinal Studies Bible Church in, coming from Birmingham, Alabama. Uh, last week in our, on our Wednesday night study called, our series is called Let Not Your Hearts Be Troubled. And it's, it's turned into a pretty wide, it started with John 14, 1, of course, and uh, it has pushed on into 1 Thessalonians, the fifth chapter, into a group of imperative, a cluster of imperatives, as Paul ended his book in the fifth chapter of 1 Thessalonians. And last week, out of 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, we dealt with pray without ceasing. And we gave you an example of it from Jonah inside the belly of the sea monster at the bottom of the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, I don't think that would be, that probably wouldn't be hard for any of us to imagine uh, praying without ceasing. <laughs> and so I thought that might be a good example of that idea, even though there are other ideas that can come off from it. But there's no doubt praying without ceasing in that situation, uh, and it's, it's recorded in the book of Jonah, the second chapter, his prayer is recorded. It was, I don't know, I think God has a great sense of humor, and I think when we get to heaven and we sit on that side of the events of going on on earth, I, w I think there will be a lot of sense of humor. But I think the Father got a great, had a great interesting time with Jonah in the second chapter when Jonah is praying, uh, <laughs> uh, and and uh, he allows uh, much of it recorded and some of it, he, he probably had to clean some of it up and didn't, <laughs> I don't know, I just think God has a sense of humor. I know I finally got one when I got saved and that, that was interesting to me. But today we're going to look at James 5.16. This is a follow-up to pray without ceasing. And I got to thinking about that um, that there are probably a lot of believers that have never been taught how to pray uh, by protocol. In other words, God has a proper protocol for praying, and James talks about it in James 5.16. So I want to read that. I'm going to come to the last half. I'm going to read the whole verse, but I'm after the last half. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another. I'm going to set that aside for a moment. I want to pay attention to the effective prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. Then in verse 17, he uses Elijah as an example of that. Sunday, we will return to our, our assembly meetings on the 24th of May. We've been shut down like so many churches for a couple months. And I'm going to teach on Elijah and what he went through, uh, like James talks about here, uh, is very similar to our, our, our uh, COVID-19 crisis. It, it, uh, it shut down the entire economical system of the North Kingdom. And I'm going to talk about that uh, Sunday. In this prayer, he says here, the effective prayer of a righteous man, the effective prayer, King James says the effectual prayer. That's probably a, a pretty good way of saying it. The effective, I'm going to show you what it means in the Greek, but the effective prayer of a righteous man, a righteous man accomplishes much. And then he uses Elijah as an example in verse 17. Now, I'm not going to use Elijah as an example. I'm going to teach the protocol today. I'm going to teach the protocol. But let's, let me take, before I have a word of prayer with you, let me show you James 5.16. And let me show you the dynamics of the Greek language in it. It's really interesting. For example, if you have a study guide that's on your study guide, if you don't have a study guide, then you can go to our website, doctrinalstudies.com. You can pull down uh, notes. Uh, but here's what it actually says. It says that the word effective is energeo. It's where you get the English word energy. Um, it's a present active participle, and this, this would be uh, a lot of energy or a consistent energy. 
it's a participle, it's an adjectival, adjectival participle. In other words, it's there to dress up the main verb. The main verb is prayer. Uh, the, su the, the subject of the sentence is prayer. And th this is a, a participle used like an adjective to dress up the, the, what he's going to talk about prayer. He said, I'm going to talk about prayer, uh, but I'm going to talk about a specific aspect of prayer, energized. This is, would be the word energized, energized prayer. Now, we're talking from a divine standpoint. Now, we're not talking about human standpoint of energy, like you might go play a football game and the coach says, I want 100%. He means, I want, I want you to give it all you got for four quarters. I don't want you to slack up on me. All right? I want you to be energized, the present tense, energized. I want you to play four quarters. I want you to be energized. And that is the word that's used here. It's a present passive, meaning that this energy has got to be produced outside your normal self that would the principle of the participle principle would be the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit and the word of God by faith, the inner God, the inner wor working of the word of God in my life. Walk by faith, walk in the spirit. Those, those, those dynamics of in energized from a divine viewpoint, not from a human standpoint, not, not emotions, uh, but rather divine assets the ministry of the indwelling Holy Spirit and the ministry of the Word of God being cycled under 2 Timothy 3, 16, 17, being cycled, inhale, exhale, and being cycled that way by the faith rest technique. Well, uh, I know that might be terms that you're not familiar with, but you should be because they're biblical. You ought to study more from our website. Well, the effective, the energized prayer, energized prayer, that's the subject, of a righteous man, that's who knows how to be energized. That that that's that's a spiritually advancing believer that you can read about in Romans the fourth chapter, sixteen. I wrote it down, sixteen through twenty-five. Sixteen through twenty-five, and you can read about it again if you're interested in what is a righteous man that can have an energized prayer that can accomplish a lot. You can read James, the second chapter, verses 21 through 24. That is not on your notes. You'll need to write that in. It's not on your notes. Uh, I got to thinking about it after I had printed this and was already committed to this. I got to thinking, I don't know if somebody, they might think that a righteous man is, is just any believer. Well, a righteous man is a believer, that's positional righteousness. I'm talking about experiential righteousness, where this person, this saved person, knows how to be righteous in his life experiences, in times of crisis, in times of normal. I mean, sometimes it's not the crisis that gets us. It's uh, too much time on our hands. We, we have it too good, and we lax. But this person knows how to be energized by the indwelling ministry of the Holy Spirit and by uh, walking by faith, walking in the Spirit. That's, that's who I'm talking about. The, the energized prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. A school is a present active indicative. Uh, uh, can, can accomplish much. Accomplish much. Can accomplish much. Uh, this word is a word that means knows how to dig down deep and play the four quarters with 100% where you leave it all on the field. The present active indicative, which is the word accomplish, is the main verb. And the participle, while it dresses up the word prayer of a righteous man, this is where it happens. Present, active, indicative is the main verb. Can accomplish much. See, if you will exercise walking in the power of the Spirit, walking by faith, not by works, not by sight, not by sight, not by works, not by the flesh, gratify self. No self-motivation to get pleasure. 
If you do it to do God's, God's will, to do, do God's will out of understanding what his word told you, this, is, this passage is for you. You got to know what the Bible says. And this passage is for you. The energized prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. And he uses Elijah as an example of an effective or energized prayer accomplishing much, listen to me, during a national crisis. Now, we've only been in this thing uh, two or three months. And it shut down our system. I mean, it locked us down economically and every other way. It shut down the church, shut down the, the free enterprise system. Elijah's prayer dealt in a crisis just like this. Listen to me now. Well, we've had it three months, and we're, we're stir crazy, and we got food lines and yada, yada. Listen to me now. How about three and a half years? How about three and a half years? Your economic system set, shut down for three and a half years. I want that to sink in because you've only been, we've only been at three months. In James 5.16 is the prayer, is about the prayer that Elijah prayed at the end of three and a half years. Where God didn't give him any dew or any rain, D-E-W, no dew and no rain, and it shut down the agricultural system. It dried them up economics. And God turned the faucet back on because of Elijah's prayer. The energized prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much, and he used Elijah in that incident in 1 Kings 17. If you're interested more, I'm going to talk more about it on Sunday, but that's quite a that's quite a task. Quite a task. And I'm going to go over this a lot on Sunday. Okay? Today's lesson, and then we'll have a word of prayer. Today's lesson is applicable to our present national crisis in America today in COVID-19 and the rest of the world. My lesson today is apropos to you in America and you and other nations. If you're a Christian, if you believe that Jesus died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead on the third day as the source of your salvation so that you can be saved by grace through faith and not of yourself, it is a gift, this lesson is for you. Because to have this prayer, you got to understand the protocol. It all starts with the proper protocol to prayer. And after a word of prayer, I'm going to show it to you as an acrostic that you could maybe remember it and begin to work this out in your life so that you can have an energized prayer life like Elijah. And we're sure going to need it in America. Okay? Let's have a word of prayer. Remember, the Bible is a spiritual book for spiritual people for spiritual living. You can't learn it nor live it in carnality. Evidence of carnality in the Christian life, personal sin. Could be mental attitude type sins, sins of the tongue or overt sins. What should I do? How do I get out of carnality and back into spirituality? The ministry of the indwelling Holy Spirit, 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. How do I do that? 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, that is, name him, cite him, come into agreement with God because you've quenched the Spirit, you've grieved the Spirit. The Spirit wants control of your life. That's why he came. But it's volitional. But he's there to minister the things of God out of your life. Not just to your life, but out of them. 
So if I confess my sins, personal sins, I just mentioned three categories. He, God, is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us. That cleansing takes us back to the cross as a believer. And the blood of Christ cleanses me from my personal sin, not my Adamic sin like in salvation. And what does it do? It restores me to spirituality, 1 Corinthians 3, 1 through 3. So let's have a word of prayer. I gave you a moment as a believer priest, 1 Peter 2. You're a believer priest. If you believe the gospel, you're a believer priest. And it's your time to get yourself where the Holy Spirit can teach you the word of God in a way that can cause you to have energized prayer out of your righteous soul that can accomplish much, not just for your soul, but for the na national soul. Elijah, he prayed, and it affected the whole nation. His prayer affected the whole nation. That's a prayer I want for us to have, and you've got to understand the protocol. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you today for your love, mercy, and grace extended to us by the character of God and not by the character of man. I want to thank you for the work of Christ on the cross. I want to thank you for the word of God that teaches us the protocol so that we can live an energized prayer life of a righteous person experientially, living out the righteousness of God in our everyday life through the power of the Spirit and the power of the Word so that our, light, our prayers are accomplishing much, not just for us, for others, even our nation and the world itself. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, if you don't have a study guide, get a pencil and paper. Come on. Go get a pencil and paper. You got your Bible. Look. <laughs> this is Wednesday. How many times do I tell you? Come to class. It's Bible study. Come to class with a Bible, pencil, and a piece of paper. Now, on that piece of paper, the acrostic is, is facts. And I want you to write it down a column. The first letter, F, then A, then C, then T, and S at the bottom. Facts. The proper protocol. I'm going to give you the facts of the proper protocol to prayer so that you can begin to have an effective, energized prayer life. Something that can... I mean, most people pray and just throw it up in hopes that it hits. Listen, the Bible says that you should be able to hit the bullseye every time you pray. I'm going to teach you how to do it. I mean, every time you pray, boom, you've hit the bullseye, dead center. And that's what I want you to understand. Christians must be taught how to pray, the protocol. In Luke, the 11th chapter, write this down. In Luke, the 11th chapter, 1 through 4, the disciples of Jesus came to him and they said, we want you to teach us to pray just as John the Baptist taught his disciples to pray. They saw something in the prayer life of John's disciples that reminded them of the prayer life of Jesus and they wanted Jesus to teach them. And so he did. He taught him, taught him the protocol. I'm going to expand that into our dispensation, but he taught him. I'm going to teach you. I promise you, if you will get down facts of the protocol of how to have an effectual or energized prayer life that accomplished much, this will revolutionize your life. It was sure revelation. You say, well, I don't know why. I hear people say, well, I don't know why I should pray. If God already knows what I'm going to... Listen, if you have that kind of communication with your wife, your wife is miserable. It's a two-way street communications. That's prayer. Prayer that can accomplish much. Prayer 
that it can accomplish. Prayer there accomplishes much here. So, Luke 11, 1 through 4, is one of your references. Now, facts. Let's go through. F-A-C-T-S, five. You got five points. An acrostic of an effectual prayer life, facts. First fact. The F stands for all prayer is addressed to the Father in the name of Jesus. It's, it's like sending, a, a mailing an envelope to somebody. You have to put their name down. That's where it's going. And you have to put your name up here. Who's sending it in case you need a return address? Of course we want a return address. And so down here, it's addressed to the Father up here in the name of Jesus Christ. See, my name's not there. I'm sending the letter. All prayer must be addressed to the Father. You find that in Luke, the 11th chapter, 1 through 4. That's where you find it. You also find it in Matthew 6, 9. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. You know it. It's addressed to whom? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. On earth as it is in heaven. You know that prayer. If you don't, go back and read it. Matthew 6, Luke 11. In the name of Jesus. John 14. John 14, 13 and 14. Whatever you ask in my name, Jesus said at the Last Supper, that, that will I do, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son if you ask me Anything in my name, I will do it. That is a pretty good promise, isn't it? Got to address it to the Father in the name of the Son. And when the Son answers it, the Father is glorified. Because it's all based on the divine plan of protocol. The divine plan of God in protocol. So that's the first thing that has to be done. You have to understand the protocol of how to mail, to mail a prayer out and back. Okay? You could also uh, look at John 16, 22, and uh, uh, John 16, 23, and 24. That would be helpful to you. All prayer is addressed to the Father in the name of Jesus. That's why people will start with, with, with the Father and they'll wind up in the name of Jesus. I pray in the name of Jesus. Now, the word ask. The A stands for ask. You must ask. Now, listen, this is real important. You must ask according to the will of God. You can't just ask for anything. Jesus said anything. But what he means by anything is according to the will of God. How do I know it? Well, we find it later, but I know it when he, in the Garden of Gethsemane, he says, not my will, but thy will be done. That was a prayer. He was praying. You can't just ask for anything. You have to ask according to the will of God, and you will get it done. You will get it done. You will get the answer, and the answer will fit your life perfectly. You say to me, well, what about, what about? Well, I'm just telling you the protocol. I'm telling you the protocol. Here, here it is, 1 John 5, 14 and 15. If you ask anything according to my will, he hears you. And you know if he hears you, he answers the prayer. That's 1 John 5. That's, you know, you need to look and read it. I just told you kind of a jest of what it says. You got to ask according to his will. Then you know if you ask according to his will, he listens, he hears, and he listens and he responds to it according to his will. Now he's going to do it in his timing, but he's going to do it. He's going to do it in his way, and he's going to do it. 
He's going to do it. It's called his will. So you always got to be sure. I say to people, always ask yourself before I pray, what's the Bible say? What's the Bible say about what you're about to pray? What's the Bible say? Well, I don't know. Well, don't you think you should? Because that's how you pray according to his will. From the word goes to the will, from the will to the work or the prayer. The accomplish as much. You must ask according to the will of God by faith. You send, it, you send the prayer. You, ad, you, you address it properly. You put the contents in it properly according to his will inside on the letter side. And then you mail it and wait for the return, the reply. This is all faith. I mail it. Faith here comes by hearing the word of God. I mail it. I have a waiting faith, Psalms 27. My faith waits on the response. Now, I'm going to tell you one little part that's important you understand. By faith, now watch this, without doubting. You know where the doubt comes in? Well, if it's mailed properly, there's no doubt I mailed it right. But how it got handled, or maybe it got lost, or maybe, I don't know, doubt. You're to, the two protocols, address it to the Father in the name of Jesus, according to the will of God, by faith without doubt. James 1, 6 and 8. Ask in faith without doubting. Then he goes on to describe the doubting who, who, who had the prayer for faith and then began to doubt. He calls him a double-minded man. A double-minded man. And he says, the moment you leave faith and get into doubt, don't expect an answer in doubt. The, the, the answer to doubt is go back to faith. It is faith that gets the answer. It is faith that is, that is credited to God for your righteousness. They go back to James 2 and Romans 4. Those passages I gave you that's not on your sheet of paper, and you need to read them. He gives, there's an example in, in Matthew, the 14th chapter, 28 through 31. This is this famous Jesus walking on water, a storm. And Peter wants to get out of the boat and go. Wants to come out. Can I come out and walk with you on the water in the storm? Sure. And the Bible says Peter got his eyes on the waves and took them off from Jesus or couldn't see Jesus anymore because of the waves and lost his faith and went to doubt. And he began to sink like a, a sinker. He became a sinker, not a walker. And Jesus had to go rescue him. He became a first responder. Doubt. Matthew 21, 20, 21 and 22. He says, Jesus says, All things you ask in prayer, believing, you will receive. See? No doubt. You ask according to the will of God, it's done. He tells you, I've got it. Faith is what keeps it there. Believing. 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 Without doubt. These are all. Now, I got the F, I got the A, now we go to C. C stands for confess. You must confess personal sin before you pray. That's why we do it here. 
we never start anything around this church under my leadership that we don't have prayer. When we have prayer, we, we tell them, you've got to, listen, your prayer is worthless if you've got personal sin. Mental attitudes, sins of the tongue, overt sins have got to be confessed before you get engaged with this program. You must confess your personal sins before praying. You know, a lot of people, they don't pray without ceasing. In other words, keep a sense about you of prayer. So they start their day out. They might have a word of prayer on their way to work, and by the time they get to work, they've lost all that because of traffic and all the people, people peeping their horns and all this kind of stuff. Maybe even something on the radio has got you ticked off. <laughs> you stay that way all day long in carnality. You come home at night, and they have still in the carnal condition. You go to bed, and you say, well, I think I'd better confess my sins. You do it at the end of the day. You're supposed to do it all during the day. Whenever you commit a sin, you're supposed to confess it. You shouldn't have long list. You shouldn't have, I, I shouldn't ever have you come to me and say, well, Ron, I don't know. What, prayer, what sin am I supposed to confess in 1 John 9, 1, 9? Because I haven't confessed sin for 20 years. Do I have to go back and go, no, the last one you did, that'll do it. God wants you engaged in the program. What's in the future? Not what's in the past. Where you are right now and what's in your future. I confess my sin for the future because I'm now back into the ministry of the Holy Spirit where my future is. The dynamics of my prayer life is in the power of the Spirit. It's in the power of the Word. I need to confess my sins. Psalm 66, 18. If I regard iniquity in my heart, he will not hear me. If I regard it in my heart, what should I do with it? I would confess it. 1 John 1, 9. James in the fourth chapter, verse 3 says, be careful of your motive that you pray. He says, if your motive is wrong in what you pray, if your motive is self-pleasure and self-desire rather than God's will and to please God, like Hebrews eleven six. 6, Prayer's not going to work. James 4, 3. Well, why ain't my prayers getting answered? You're asking with wrong motive. Your motives are wrong. You have self-interest and not divine interest. In the fourth chapter, verse 8, he says, you should purify your hearts, you double-minded. That wrong motive. James 4, 8. Now we've looked at F. We've looked at A. Ask according to his will. We've looked at C. You've got to confess your sin to get out of carnality and back into spirituality. That's very important. Now we go to T. The T stands for pray with a thankful heart. Pray with a thankful heart for the grace of God in your life. I wanted F-A-C-T-S. But I'm telling you, T needs to be up at the front. I just wanted something maybe that you could remember, the facts of the protocol of prayer. Something that maybe you could identify with. Maybe something you could actually remember in your soul that would give you the guidance. But I'm telling you, a thankful heart. Now, you could put it at the end of a prayer like I did here, or you could put it at the beginning of prayer, but it needs to be in your prayer. I am thankful. Every time I pray, I am thankful for your love, mercy, and grace. The three doctrines that just overwhelm my life in the character of God that deals with my life every day. 
Listen, there ought to be some days when you pray that it's nothing but thanksgiving. I said, Father, I just want to have a time with you and I want to tell you, listen, you should keep a record. If you want to have a great prayer life at the end of each day, keep a tab on what God has done during that day that you know he intervened in your life, that, that God was present and powerful in your life. It, they thank him. And at the end of the way, look, at the end of the week, look what he did on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and maybe maybe Saturday night at the end of the week. Thank him again for all the things that week. Now I know we have thankful hearts, but do we express them to the one? that's created everything necessary for us to have a thankful heart. A thankful heart. Ephesians 5.20 Always giving thanks for all things in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ to God. Yes, our Father. <laughs> Isn't that wonderful? Give, always giving thanks for all things. So that's why I think if you could get a journal going, maybe get it. Uh, for me, I use my, uh, I use my uh, calendar. I have a month, I have a yearly calendar by months and weeks. And I, I've learned to get enough space, buy one that has enough space to write some things in my journal. And then I keep those every year. And I, I see the awesomeness of God in my life. The awesomeness. I look at it from a daily standpoint. I'm just telling you, a thankful heart is a thankful heart, and God is thankful for every thankful heart. <laughs> I can tell you that. But how are, you gonna, how are you going to give thanks, always giving thanks for everything or for all things if you don't keep a journal? I can't keep that. I can't keep up with it. I can only remember the big things. You see, when God intervenes in your life, they're all big. They're all miraculous in some form or another. It'd be good for you to remember that. In Colossians, the fourth chapter, verse 2, Paul writes, devote yourselves to prayer, keeping alert in it, in this attitude, of thanksgiving. Devote yourself to prayer, but keep alert in this idea, the attitude, the gratitude of attitude, the attitude of gratitude of thanksgiving. Isn't that wonderful? And of course, probably the most famous of all passages on this would be Philippians 4. I'll just read it. You're familiar with it. Be anxious for nothing. Wouldn't that be good? But in everything, don't you love the way he went on? I mean, you're a ball of nerves. Be anxious for nothing. He's told you, unwind. But listen to what he said. Be anxious for nothing. But in everything. He went from nothing to everything. By prayer and supplications, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Watch what he tells you. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension. Where's that all comprehension? I'll tell you where it is. Be anxious for nothing but in everything. Now let me. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension. See, that's how this whole thing started in verse 6. Shall guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. The peace of God will guard your heart and your mind. But you got, there's some things that you have. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, let your requests be made known to God with thanksgiving. And the peace of God will take charge of your heart and your your mind. See, there's a protocol. 
And it's all involved with a thanks an attitude of gratitude of thanksgiving. You need to add this. You need to have this to be an important part of your prayer life, people. And the S in closing, the S. You must pray in the power of the Holy Spirit. The word for S is spirit, Holy Spirit. You must, you must pray with a thankful heart. You must pray in the power of the indwelling Holy Spirit. The power is able, the power of the Holy Spirit is able to get a letter, a prayer sent from earth to heaven right to the desk right there. Well, here it is. Romans, the 8th chapter, 26 and 27. In the same way, the Spirit also helps our weaknesses, for we do not know how to pray as we should, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. Now, that's not your groanings. That's his. That's him agonizing over cleaning up the mail so they can get there. <laughs> He's the postmaster. For he intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. He knows that letter can't get there until it's cleaned up. It's, the contents have to be according to the will of God. And so he intercedes according to the will of God. He's got to clean, got to get the letter cleaned up for prototype, protocol, protocol to cross the desk, the throne of grace of God. At Hebrews 4.16. Ephesians 6.18. At all times, pray in the power of the Holy Spirit. At all times, pray in the Spirit. At all times, pray in the Spirit. How do you do that? Right there. It's a choice. You can play in the fret, you can pray in the flesh, or you can pray in the spirit. You engage the spirit volitionally. I know you're indwelling me. I know you're there uh, to pray my prayer for me, to guide me in my prayer life, to intercede on my behalf. So I'm just going to tell you what I. What it all going? And he's there to do the recording and, and to get it cleaned up. Now, you're not going to be able to do it in the Holy Spirit uh, if you have unconfessed sin in your life. So that one of the first things you have to do is you have to confess your sins. Mental attitudes, sins of the tongue, overt sins have to be confessed. You know, so the first thing you do, if it comes to my prayer time, you know, the first thing I'm going to do, I'm going to check my spiritual temperature. I'm going to check my spiritual temperature. Am I in the flesh or in the spirit? If I'm in the flesh, it's due to some kind of sin I've committed. What is that sin? I've got to confess. Now I'm ready to have prayer life. I'm ready to have prayer. How about Jude 20? Building yourself up up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit. Do you know what that is? This is walking in the Spirit, and this is walking by faith. Okay? They both play an enormous role in the effectual or the energized prayer of a righteous man accomplishing much. 
It is my prayer today that you will take seriously the protocol. You need to know how to pray in order to have an effective prayer life. You need to know how. And we've taught you today how to pray. Now, we've taught it in the English, and I hope you'll get somebody to translate it to you from the English to whatever language you speak. This lesson is vitally important to your life. And it's based on the acrostics of fact. F-A-C-T-S. Let us pray. Well, Heavenly Father, we thank you today for the freedom that we have to assemble. And we thank for an internet that's able to send it to people who are not able to attend. And we're able to catch them where they are, whether they're whatever the device they're listening to us by the internet, by the cell phone, by the internet, or however they do it. But we're thankful for that. It is my prayer today that everybody would learn how to pray the effectual prayer of a righteous man which can accomplish as much. There is much to be accomplished, Father, and we need people to know how to pray to do it in the church of Jesus Christ. We have aided them, Father, in some way in this acrostic of facts, facts about the protocol of an effectual, fervent prayer. I pray, Father, the Holy Spirit would minister the truth of this lesson in Jesus' name. Amen.